I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly delighted to be here with Karen Davis, whose work I've long admired. So this is a real treat for me. Hello to all of you. Hello from sunny Portugal. And um, I'm going to share a project with you today about the Portuguese horse known as Cavallo Lusitano. And Michael, I'm going to share my screen, if that's okay with you. Yep. And I hope that you all can see this opening screen now. The title of my book is Cavallo Lusitano, The Spirit Within. The publisher has done a number of books that have the spirit within in the title. That publisher is Veritas Editions from out near Seattle, Washington. And his books always started with the spirit within and then the title. And I said, no, 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 we have to change it. So we have Cavallo Lusitano, the spirit within. In the Portuguese language, they never say uh, just Lusitano or Cavallo. Cavallo is the Portuguese word for horse. It's always the two words together. I don't know why, but it is. This book is a fine press edition, a very limited edition production, 25 copies that are numbered and five copies that are lettered and three artist proofs. As I, uh, as I mentioned, Veritas Editions is the publisher and Craig approached me a number of years ago, having seen some of my work with the horses and asked me if I'd be interested in doing a platinum palladium edition. And he said, I have in mind Stan Klimek to do the, the platinum prints and I would love to see your work produced this way. Well, I don't know how you say no to that. <laughs> and so of course I said, yes, immediately. And we set about over a course of three years of putting together this book. He asked me in 2016 and the book got started really in earnest in 2018 because he was finishing up another project. Sadly, in late 2016, my husband fell from one of our horses and was killed. So the book took on an importance for me that it hadn't had prior to this time. So it became an homage to my husband and therefore I had to make it the very finest that I possibly could. And Craig wanted to start with the idea of a wooden clamshell. And he approached Jim Fitzgerald who is known for making view cameras about making a custom drop spine case to hold the book in. And we did a couple of prototypes and he had to adjust the spine and do various things. And finally, uh, this is the beautiful case that we ended up with. Now, fine press editions have to be archival in every facet of their production. And so the walnut wood that you're seeing here has been aged more than five years in order to meet the archival standards. From the outside of the case, all the way through the inside and through the entirety of the book, I wanted each piece of the book to reflect a quality of the Lusitano. And the case in its, I don't think this is too strong a word, let's just majesty, fit for me the Lusitano. The Lusitano is the horse of kings. And if you look at any of the old masters paintings and you're looking at Charles II or any other royalty sitting on a horse, they're sitting on a Lusitano horse, not just a, not a thoroughbred, not an Arab, unless it's a, a Spanish painting perhaps, uh, but a Lusitano. And that's because these horses are incredibly noble, but they're also incredibly kind and gentle. And if you're a horse trainer, and your client happens to be the king, the last thing you want is for him to be thrown off of a horse. And so the Lusitano is the natural mount for kings. So we have a project that has to be noble. It has to be um, regal in, in all of its qualities, but also very tactile, uh, very textural. And so in the photograph that you're looking at, the you see the case with the, with the etched plaque that has the name Cavallo Lusitano in a typeface that I felt was uh, certainly noble and classical, but also accessible. And that typeface is called Albertus. In the left-hand corner in the bottom, you see a covering 
And that's um, a piece of artisan felt made by a wonderful woman in Oregon, Janice Arnold, um, to reflect how I described to her the coat of the baby Lusitano. Most of them are born very dark and 65% or so by the time they're six or seven years old will go gray. And they, there's a stage where they get polka dot looking and then turn into dapples and then finally into gray. So that piece of felt cradles the book in the wooden case so it protects all the edges, but it's also there to look like the coat of the baby Lusitano and it feels very much like it as well. And then we have a, a, a photograph in the upper right hand corner of the one of the, well, it's the opening photograph in the book tipped onto the page and you can see a little bit of the tab binding and we'll get to that in just a moment as well. And also included in the book in the lower right hand photograph, aside from the book, which is 15 platinum palladium prints, one photograph viewer, then underneath there's a portfolio with three gum over palladium prints included as well. And I'll show you a little bit more about that. The cover of the book has um, a, a recessed area and that plaque again is reproduced in the walnut and set into the recessed area of the cover. The material on the cover is an Italian silk and then in the lower left hand corner we get to the first thing that I picked out for the book and that is this wonderful paper from cave paper called O'Malley Crackle. And the reason I chose it is because it looked like the coat of one of my Lusitanos as he was working in the summertime. He's a lighter bay with the sun on him, but when he's sweating and working, then you see those darker uh, striations. And that was truly the first thing that we picked. Craig and I were at Codex in San Francisco, which happens every other year. And I saw that paper and I said, this has to be our end leaf. And as it turned out, it was really a perfect choice for how, for what we did for the rest of the book. So uh, in the upper image, which is kind of small, I'm sorry about that, you can see the page layout and the photograph tipped in on the right hand side. The type is set in English as well as Portuguese. So that's why you have the two columns for my captions for each of the photos. And all of the work is letterpress. So every single bit by hand, page by page, of course, all the platinum prints uh, tipped on, but not only tipped on, each one is signed and editioned by me. And you just have to lift the image and you can see that in each one of the, each one of the editions. Here you can see a little bit more about the binding. In the upper left-hand corner, we have the tab binding, which allows the book to maintain its size, if you will. If we didn't include the tab on the left-hand side and we just had bound flat pages in, then the book would build up in the middle where the prints were tipped on, and that would make a very unstable binding. So the page being folded over and sewn in the gutter then with the tab allows that to remain roughly the same size. And on the upper right again, we have, you can see that the, uh, the work is done in English as well as Portuguese. And then the lower left hand corner, you can kind of tell the, um, the debossed nature of the letterpress. And you can see the typeface as well, which again, I chose because I wanted it to be classical, but I wanted it to be approachable as well, because that was, that is the quality of the Lusitano. And in the lower right hand corner, we can see my favorite page in the book. And that is a signature page. That page had to go all around the world, uh, 35 copies of it, to be signed by everyone that was involved in the creation of the book. In the lower left-hand corner, we see Sylvie Glatauer's name. Uh, she did the photogravure that's in the book. And, and then, so she was in Australia. Uh, Sylvia Locke, Lady Locke, wrote the, in, the uh, foreword. And she's in England, of course, I'm in Portugal and then all around the United States, the rest of the artists. So I'm very, very glad to have this page in the book. And it's something that I encourage every one of my students to do if they're creating a fine press edition or, uh, or if they have the opportunity to do this. 
when Craig first approached me and he mentioned that Stan Klemick was going to do the printing and that we were going to work with Ed Marquand, whom I know from Seattle, um, I was a little bit overwhelmed at the quality of those people. And I said, well, okay, then this is going to be entirely a collaborative effort. And I just hope that my photographs are going to hold up to it. So I'm very glad to have that page in the book. And again, I encourage everyone to be thinking about that. Lastly, as I mentioned, we have the portfolio in the, in the back behind the, uh, behind the main book. And we included this portfolio because we wanted people to have the ability to uh, frame and display prints without them having to take any part of the book apart. And it allowed me to put into the collection three vertical images that really wouldn't fit the horizontal format of the original book. But we stayed with the English and the Portuguese, and there are standalone pages for each of those, and then the print sits behind. And there are three of those in that portfolio. And in the lower right, you can see we did a, a debossed area with, um, it's not a photograph, it's a, a label, if you will. It's an inelegant name for it, but it was based on one of the photographs that you'll see in just a moment. And so now I'm going to show you not all, but a few of the images that are in the book. I began photographing the Lusitano in California in about 2006. Uh, this is the home of my dressage instructor, Dominique Barbier, and I have been friends and collaborators for more than 30 years now. And in the early 2000s, he was able to start bringing uh, Portuguese horses from Brazil into the United States. There are lots of rules about import of live animals and particularly horses, but the possibility existed to bring them from Brazil. And this is one of the first of his horses that he brought. His name is Ultraje, which translate to outrageous. And he's quite a lovely fellow. From Brazil, then I went, I'm sorry, from California, then I traveled off into Brazil with the Barbiers and then on my own and met a number of the very finest breeders there and had the opportunity to photograph their horses. This was one of the last images that was included in the book because after Craig asked me to have 18 or so uh, photographs included, I thought, I don't have 18 photographs even after 13 years, they had to be as fine as I could possibly make them. And I just wasn't satisfied with four or five of the images. And he said, well, I'm okay with, you know, 12 or 13 top tier images, and then, then a few second tier. <laughs> and I thought, there's no way that we can do that. And so off I went to Brazil and I had a really magical week of photography it was bittersweet for me. This was after my husband's passing. And I went back to all of the farms where we had ended up working together. He was a presenter of Lusitanos. And of course, I was a photographer. Um, but the light was magical. It seemed everywhere I went. And this was one of the images that, that came about. This is an early image back in California. And a very, very cold morning. So the dust is mixing with the breath from the horse. This is an image that uh, I showed you the label. This horse's name is Fusilero. For a brief time, he was my horse. And then he went to live with a friend of mine in Arizona. But he's a very, very gentle horse and a gentle giant of a horse. He's very large for a Lusitano. This is a horse named Lorapio. Lorapio means thief in Portuguese. Larapio is very important to the entire breed of the Lusitano horse. He is a noted sire and a particularly noted grandsire. If you know anything at all about bloodlines for horses, uh, you know, all of those lineages are important. And I had the opportunity to ride and get to know Larapio for many years. He's passed now, but he was a wonderful, wonderful horse. And now we're photographing finally in Portugal. This is the home of my cousin, Ana Batista. And Ana is the world's best known female bullfighter. And this is one of her bullfighting horses. And though it's taken in the middle of the day, when I saw the dapples on the horse 
and I saw all of the marks in the wall of the training arena, I just saw the night sky. And so I exposed to have it be as dark as I possibly could, but still a strong image. And then we get to the verticals that I spoke about. The very old horse who happens to be a world champion. And when I photographed him uh, using all natural light, always with the horses, my goal was to show all of his wisdom, all of his age and experience. And of course we see a bit of that in the, in the gray touches above his eye and in his muzzle, but he's a wonderful fellow. Here's a vertical portrait of Lorapio. Another uh, horse here in Portugal at the home of Luis Valenza. Another photograph from Brazil. People often remark about this photograph and talk about its uh, seeming transparency. And what we have here is a photograph in the middle of the day, a very harsh light. And happily, the owner of this arena, most of them are open on the sides, but you know, hard light slanting in. Anyhow, he re replaced his footing and put white sand in instead of you know brown, icky kind of stuff. So it's reflecting that very strong light back up onto the underneath of the horse. And we're going to finish with two portraits, a close up of the only horse in the whole group whose name I do not know. Uh, I know that he's a Quimbra stallion, but I don't know his name. But he represents all Lusitanos to me with his very kind eye. And then finally, my favorite portrait, again made in Brazil during that week, of a very kind, gentle horse with a strange name. His name is Al Capone. And um, it was just natural light, and he happened to be walking past uh, an, an outdoor wash stall. And I saw how it looked very much like a studio, and I thought, please just have him stop there. And I was able to make his portrait. And so there you have Cavallo Lusitano. And if you're at all interested in anything else in some of the other books that I've done, then you can have a look here on the website. And I'm going to stop my share and welcome any questions. Thank you very much, Karen. It's absolutely gorgeous work and a fabulous presentation. Um, Thank you. Anybody Thank you. have anything for Karen? I got a thumbs up. I like that. Sure. <laughs> Two thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that, that's Just quite say, a oh, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Stunning, stunning work. I, oh, thank you, Ellen. Thank you very much. Mind blowing. Well, I love them. And, you know, it's when we love something we're photographing, generally it comes through. So thank you. <clears throat> um, that's quite a production you went through to uh, produce this book. Yes. Um, it took a couple years to get it together. Is that what I understood you to say? It did, Jim. We The idea was in late, well, mid-2016, but as I mentioned, Craig was finishing a wonderful project that he did on alternative process photographers from Australia, and that's available on his site at veritaseditions.com. It's a fabulous book, but he needed to finish that up and get the marketing done and then start in earnest for Covala Lusitano, which was early 2018. Okay. In late 2019, the book was ready. And uh, what is the cost of a of a of, of one of the books? Uh, with the pricing tier where they are now, that book is eighty five hundred dollars. Okay. And it's fine press editions generally are between three and twenty thousand um, dollars, and it it is a lot of money, absolutely. But it's also twenty or so, well, 15, 16, 19 platinum palladium prints that are exquisite. And, you know, I give all credit for that, Stan Klemek. He is a, a master at what he does. Well, I, it is expensive, but uh, in um, perspective, uh, 21st editions, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Oh, book. very much so, yes. Yeah, but their, their, their books run 25 and 30,000. So. Yes, and Stan was the printer for a number of those books, which is why we were thrilled to have him. 
and he's the printer uh, for the estate of Imogene Cunningham and does oh. a lot of work for George Tice and Sally Mann. And sure. for him to touch my work was, like that's I said, a dream come true. Yeah, that's uh, quite a compliment. Yes, yes. Well, the, the photos are absolutely gorgeous, so. Thank you. And I, 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 uh, I have a series of horse photos myself, so uh, I was very interested to see this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> What's your, um, your start in photography and how did you get to the point where you are now? And are you continuing to ride and what's your relationship with horses and do you have any new projects on the horizon? Thank you, Linda. There, that, there are a lot of questions there and I'm delighted to have each one of them. Uh, my start in photography, uh, I was tapped on the head with a magic wand. Uh, I was very interested in photography as a young girl, but did not pursue it. I had a, a career in the printing industry for more than 20 years. And then when computer technology changed what my business did, then I opened a landscape company in early 2002 into 2006. But in 2005, I turned back to my camera and I had photographed my children all through their lives, but I couldn't tell you anything about how I made those photos or anything at all. I was just a mom making photographs. But in 2005, uh, I picked up a camera and thought I need to do this for myself. I took two workshops in my life, one with Art Wolf, which was an utter disaster. And <laughs> Art and I became very good friends. And he pursued me to come and work for him for about a year and a half. And I finally relented. But in late 2005, because that workshop with Art was a disaster, they had all of their equipment stolen and the lectures couldn't happen. It, it was just a mess. Again, no fault of his. But in late 2005, another friend I made in that workshop said, come, we're going to go and have a real workshop. And we went to Maine and I had a week with Sam Abel, who has become my very dear friend. And now I teach with Sam every year and have for the last 14 years. And so I, I, I have had this tremendous mentor this whole time. But as I said, in late 2006, I finally relented and went to work for art. And you couldn't have two people on as opposite ends of the spectrum, you know, than Sam and Art, personality-wise and work-wise and all of that. But I kept my ears wide open, my eyes wide open, and learned as much as I could. In 2009, I went um, purely on my own, and I've been working that way ever since, with teaching and taking people on tours and photographing and doing long-term projects. And so the next project is a continuation of a project that I began in 2011. Um, the, a book was published and, and happily has been awarded and I'm very happy about that. But um, the title of the project is Loss and Beauty, Creating Solace in a Land of Infinite Sorrow. And that project involves composites of my original images to tell the story of the, of how we destroy when we hate through the lens of the Holocaust but it also has a hopeful message. And we don't have time to go into that now, so I won't, I'll just invite you to go to my website for that. But I am starting Loss and Beauty Part Two, which tells the story of what happened before this monolith that we think of as Auschwitz came into being. And that is the story of the Einsatzgruppen from early 1940 until mid 1942. So I'm hard at work for that now. Thank, uh, so, you uh, Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, Sam uh, Abel is one of my favorite photographers. I have several of his books and um, also had the chance to attend his uh, one of his lectures at uh, Julia Dean uh, in, in LA a number of years ago. So yes. you're very fortunate. I am incredibly fortunate. Sam's a dear friend and um, yeah. Oh, I have one more. Michael, if I can have 30 more seconds. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this, but it is, well, what I'm showing you is nine, but there are actually 10 books. They're very small. I'm doing all the work myself. And each one of them has an accordion book inside, and it's going to have 10 or original images in each one. And I did this because of the work from Loss and Beauty, 
the first title is These Cannot Be Unseen. And these are standalone images that are not composites that no one's ever seen from that five and a half years where I was working in Eastern Europe. And so that's going to be the first one. And then there are, as I said, nine other, nine other books there. So that's been my COVID project and it's just about to be announced. And so I think I like it best because it's very colorful, but there we are. <laughs> now I'm going to be quiet. Well, Thank no, you not yet. Uh, Barbara had a question about the font you chose for the project. Which project? Um, the one we're talking about. <laughs> Oh, for Cavallo Lusitano. Yes, yes. The, the display font is Albertus and the typeface begins with a P. It'll come to me and I'll email you, Michael. So if you would pass that along, that would be okay. great. Okay. That I can do. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very question. much. Thank you. Karen Davis, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay, we'll pass it to you. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. And thanks, Michael, for um, this opportunity. And Karen, I feel the same way about your work and it's great to, to be on a program with you. So um, I'm talking today about my book, Still Stepping, A Family Portrait. And I'm going to go through something about the family the Morgan Orton family, how this book came to be. I'll talk a little about influences and then I'll show you some excerpts from it. So I began um, photographing the Morgan Orton family in 1993. And uh, I was new to photography and taking my first black and white darkroom class and the Morgan Orton family was just beginning. So um, I'm related to them through marriage and um, they, were, they were willing subjects. So I just started photographing them and, and this went on for um, almost 25 years. So when I, when I started um, the, the book and the story of the Morgan Ortons, is a story of a family that um, was cruising along and then got um, clobbered by, uh, by a devastating childhood illness. And then um, it's a story through um, the quotidian of life and my photographs and their words, um, I present the narrative of um, kind of a family whose world was turned upside down and then righted by determined parents. So the, um, the Morgan Ortons in the face of this, um, uh, being jolted by childhood onset schizophrenia, have shown love, persistence, um, courage, and, and really an infectious sense of humor, which, which you will discover. And over the years, no matter what the circumstances, I photographed and they wrote, which allows me now to tell this story. And it, it hasn't escaped Morgan Orton's attention or mine that I'm from a family of four uh, with a sister who is severely physically disabled. So as the Morgan Ortons changed and adapted, I found myself thinking about my own childhood and, and years growing up in my family. So this was a project that was, uh, did not originate with the intention of being a portfolio or a book. So anytime we were together, I was always photographing the family. And I photographed kind of in the moment, so I would just be there with my camera and they got used to my presence. It wasn't until 2013, 20 years after I started photographing them, that the notion of a book came up. Um, it, it was actually through a critique group I'm in where someone suggested that this, this should be, this story should be told. So I started going through um, my, my contact sheets, um, my color, my color darkroom work, my black and white darkroom work, my digital files, and trying to identify 
images that could help tell the story. Well, I had hundreds of images. Um, that was after editing and trying to be um, brutal with myself. It, it was difficult. So I turned um, to a great photographer, Sylvia Plackey, who's also a great teacher, who I uh, studied with about photo editing um, probably six or eight years earlier. And although she said she had, had never done it, she, she said she would um, consult with me and um, help me pare down my, my work into a, 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 a book size as far as the number of photographs and so forth. So she asked me to uh, Xerox my images in small size, bring them down and bring lots of paper clips. So with a, with a hands-on approach, we talked and looked through all the photographs and she started weaving together kind of the roadmap, the visual roadmap for the book. And um, after two visits, I had the little packets on the side represent these sections of the book. I, I had that visual roadmap. But there are two, two books that have, have always um, been in my mind when I think about uh, photographing the family. And that is uh, the first on the left is Eugene Richards' Dorchester Days, which he self-published in 1978. <laughs> the story goes that he self-published um, in a factory that printed uh, jam and jelly labels. And then it was reprinted in 2000. But this Dorchester Days um, it was a book about a neighborhood in Boston, Dorchester, where he had lived for a number of years, knew people very well, and, um, and photographed them. Um, but you'll notice that he also included, he also included um, handwritten text that told more about the, um, the people or the situation and so forth. So it was quite intimate. Uh, the second book is Pictures from Home by Larry Sultan. And that was originally printed in 1999 and then reprinted again in 2017. And that book, he um, visited his uh, parents in retirement and photographed them. And they're, they're amazing photographs. But he includes in the book uh, film strips from, you know, the, that his um, father took home movies. So he includes film strips, snapshots, and text with his uh, memories and comments in it. But in his book, on, on, um, on, on uh, pages with text, some of the text is, is straight and some of it is italic. And the italic um, is the voice of, the of his parents that, uh, that they commented, they talked about things, and he included that in the book, their words. So I had, um, I had text to work with as well from the family. So I, again, I mentioned this is all the family's words. So they, they had been sending annual family letters from 1996 to 2015. It started as um, pieces they Xeroxed and then mailed and then gradually became um, emailed uh, documents. In addition to te the text, I had an essay by, by Ed Orton, the father, about his son's COS, childhood onset schizophrenia. The parents also agreed to be the subjects of a documentary in 2008. And th there was much soul searching on their part about doing it, but they decided that it was um, more important that they share their story and offer um, uh, um, help or support to other uh, families going through this. And so they decided on, on being public. I used um, some, uh, I transcribed some of the text from that um, documentary. And that's also why they were very supportive of this project for the same reasons I mentioned. Also, um, I thought I was through with the book, um, that I had completed it. And I had a, an opportunity to show it to Alison Nordstrom. And she was very supportive of the project, but she said she wanted to hear more from Maggie, who's the daughter, the able daughter. So that led me to interview each of the uh, members of the family 
and uh, transcribed those interviews. And from those interviews, I extracted, um, I excerpted text. And I also received um, an email from Ed Orton in 2018. So I use that. So, so that, that's primarily the source of the, of the text. I had uh, early decisions about the design and the book concept. I, I decided I wanted a uh, portrait orientation because I imagined someone picking it up, holding it in two hands and kind of being surrounded by the, by the images and the book. I decided that um, I would use two page spreads and uh, even though it cut across the gutter, that that was uh, something I wanted again to kind of envelop the reader. Uh, also that all the photographs would be black and white to unify this work that I had done in black and white film and color um, since 93. Also the black and white uh, film that I used was Triax and I tried to maintain that look, that Triax look. I decided again that I would exclude most posed family, family uh, photos and go with in the moment shots. And as far as the text goes, uh, this took, um, the, the, I mentioned that Sylvia Plotkin gave me the roadmap, helped me with the roadmap to the visual um, portion of the book. Selecting excerpts, juxtaposing word and image um, was a, a very big project um, for me and, and took more time than I expected, um, but was very important to me. I also went back and forth about the title uh, all through the project and um, wound up with still stepping a family portrait because it, at one point, um, Meredith, the mother says, um, two steps forward, one step back, but we're still stepping. And that was her, that was, she said that in a letter in 2015. So this is the book and this is the first page. And um, I, have a, I have a forward by Alison Nordstrom, who um, um, was a senior curator at the Eastman Kodak House. She's a, a, a historian of photography. And I'm, I'm very grateful for, to her for writing um, the forward. In it, she talks about the family um, as subject from fine art phot photography to vernacular. Um, she also um, talks about various photographers who've done this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for her reception of my book. The second essay is by Jeffrey A. Lieberman, MD. He's the head of psychiatry at the Columbia University Medical School. He's an expert in the field of childhood onset schizophrenia and uh, speaks and writes widely on this. And so his essay acknowledges that a mental illness in a family affects a whole family. He talks and describes what childhood onset schizophrenia is and how it impacts the child, of course. And he talks about the challenges of research and technology in this field. So, so between these two, it's real grounding in, in this subject and, um, and I, I'm grateful to both writers. Bulk of the book is still stepping, and uh, the, the the book has over 80, 80 photographs. It's almost two hundred pages long, and I'm just going to show some excerpts from the book. And also, um, I will um, I've selected a few a few just to give you a, a sense of the of the um, the text, which is an important part of the book. Periodically, I have photographs of the of the portraits of the two children as they get older. As an infant, Parker was very good natured and a bit of a clown by age one. He was very sociable. By, by school age, standardized testing placed him at the top percentile. He found school very boring. He was quite good at solving problems such as those published by the Mensa Society. And although I could not understand his reasoning, he seemed to arrive at the correct answers. And I'll note now the design of the book is at the bottom of the page you'll see um, it, it cites where the text came from. In this case, Ed's essay.
School seems a breeze for Maggie. She takes tap ballet and ballet lessons and has joined the school Girl Scout troop. Parker has been taking a soccer class with the town rec center and is a fierce competitor in the chess club. The ongoing struggle to make the classroom activities competitive with the excitement of whatever is going on in Parker's brain hasn't gotten any easier, but that was probably too much to hope for. Once again, though, we have struck it lucky in getting a teacher with a sense of humor about the whole thing. April marked the beginning of Parker's journey through the child psychiatry inpatient maze. When he emerged nearly a year later, he was a very different boy, as was his family. At the bottom, the team left to discuss Parker's case. 10 minutes later, we were informed that he would be accepted into the COS clinical study. We knew this was a giant step toward the di diagnosis we dreaded. In July 2003, Parker was admitted to the Program for Childhood Onset Schizophrenia at the National Institute for Health. Meredith says, the doctor said, congratulations, he qualifies to be in our schizophrenia trial. And that was the hardest day. That was the day I had to let go of so much hope that it was something smaller and more manageable. Those of you who are behind on Morgan and Family News, I'll catch you up with a brief summary. For one major issue, while it has not redefined our family, means we all have a, we will all have a life of accommodation to some degree or another, but we are back to living life rather than just surviving a crisis. Mags has been an absolute trooper through all of this. She's always been able to find a way to be comfortable in pretty much any social setting. And she used that gift well in the last year and a half. Uh, this page is for Karen. <laughs> Maggie says, my dear mother decided in November 2011 to try a horse riding lesson as an I've, I've turned 50 challenge and decided this May to buy a horse. I know, I know. So now we own a horse. Madre spends her days at the high school teaching, her afternoons at the barn and her evenings at home. Nope, just home long enough to grab some things to bring to the barn. And Maggie says in a letter in 2012, yes, I've been accepted to a university, Michigan at Ann Arbor. No, I don't know where I'm going yet. I didn't apply to insert Harvard, Princeton, Yale, Stanford, MIT here. No, I don't have a job. No, I don't ride a horse. And Meredith says, through all of this, Parker continues to work hard at his transition program and juggling. All his aunts who have seen him juggling the big knives are horrified, but he continues to get better and better at it. No blood in months. Maggie has transitioned to BWOC, Big Woman on Campus at Michigan. Ed is transitioning from being on severance pay to facing the fact that he is either unemployed or retired. Parker is finishing up his last year at New Road School. He turns 21 in June and so reaches the magical age of transition. He's exploring pet grooming, horticulture, and now plumbing. He continues to practice his juggling, which he's really good at. That's the last page in this section. And then I have excerpts from um, interviews I did with, um, with each person in the family. And I, I'm just going to read a couple. I just chose a couple for this. Um, I asked Maggie, how do you think about your family? And Maggie said, I think about schizophrenia sometimes because it's such a big part of our lives. But I also think about our dog howling and my mother's horse fixation. And I think about us at the beach house and having steamers. 
but the big picture, I'm okay with that being what people think about us. It's just how things go. And Ed said, I had asked about Parker and Ed said, back to Parker, I'm also thinking about starting a small business power washing decks and houses. We could probably employ a couple of other special needs kids too. We're going to rent out a power washer and do the deck out here. We'll take it for a test drive. That's something I could do personally. And then this is the last text in, in, uh, in the book. Parker has started at the nearby stop and shop beginning at the beginning of October. He never asked how much he was being paid. Uh, he mostly does the second shift. This required two miracles. He could be outside, he couldn't be outside after dark, and he couldn't possibly stay up so late. We just shifted evening meds to 10:30 and got him a flashlight, and everything worked out fine. The various managers report he's doing a great job. He usually forgets to pick up his paycheck on Thursdays. And this is the last photo in the book. And then um, I have a page of text, but I have a lot of people that I acknowledge from my, from of course the family, Meredith, Ed, Parker, and Maggie, to people in critique groups, to photographers who've looked at the project and offered me uh, help along the way. And I I end with my sister, who I mentioned earlier, Cheryl A. Davis, who I realized was a part of the project in ways I hadn't expected. I also have a number of endorsements in the book, and I'm, I, uh, some are uh, specialists um, in uh, mental health, others are uh, uh, in photography, um, and some have been um, impacted by uh, schizophrenia in different ways. So I've, I self-published the book. It was, I uh, published with Conveyor Studio. The final design was Christine Labby and, and, and um, I'm very grateful for her for, um, for turning it into such a, a handsome looking piece. Um, I, I had everything laid out with respect to um, the pages and what went on them, but uh, she did magic. Um, the book is uh, eight and three quarters by six inches. It's duotone, so it's printed with black and grays. So it's a, it's a true black, the prints are true black, and the cover, which I love, is silver, rice shine. Um, I sell the book on my website, a familyportrait.net. Um, it can also be reached through our gallery, which is davisortongallery.com, and through my personal website, yes, that Karen Davis. Com. It's also available at the Griffin Museum. And here are the four Morgan Ortons. So let me, that completes my talk. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Karen. Anybody so, else uh, have anything? Yeah, I do. Uh, that's a, quite a project, uh, 25 years, I think you said. Yeah. Um, why, why did you um, get involved in, in that project? I mean, it, it's quite a commitment and uh, um, there's, there's so much interaction that you can see in the photos between you and the family. It's just really, I'd just like to know a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, I'm related to them through marriage. Um, my husband and Ed Orton are brothers. So um, it was natural and is natural that we'd see them um, um, we live in Hudson, New York. They, they uh, were in New Jersey for, for most of the time. And so we'd get together four or five times a year. When Maggie talked about thinking about steamers and the beach, we spent we usually spent a week together at the beach. <clears throat> but I did start because they were willing. <laughs> and I was just starting as a black uh, in, uh, studying photography. And so it was always, um, they were just used to my camera being around and and I had great fun doing it. So when, when Parker got sick, it was like nothing had changed as, with respect to our relationship as a family and we just kept going. Well, you, you're, 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 your photographs are very intimate. You know, there's, a, you know um, there's a real, you can see a genuine interaction between you and the family members. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's very special, I think. Thank you. I, uh, I really enjoy this journey of yours. You know, it does take such 
persistence. And I bet there were times when you didn't want to pick up your camera, but you were compelled to do it. And the question I have is so many photographers, when they have such a volume of images, struggle with the editing part. As you worked with Sylvia, could you perhaps identify two, three, four things that made a difference in how you came to edit your work? Let's see. Um, well, I think I, I think some of the editing, if, I, if I'm answering, if I'm understanding your question, some of the editing was, um, was natural by chronology. And you start uh, dealing with um, years of, of images. And also there were more images some years than others. So, you know, <laughs> sometimes there was a lot more to, to choose from. Um, and some of it was, um, we could identify photographs um, uh, that, that for me and for us stood out, you know? Um, um, so I, I, I wanted to be sure those were in. But other times, um, um, I, I think as in pe when people talk about sequencing a book, sometimes you need a photo photograph to move to the next section, <laughs> move on. And so sometimes a photograph would act as a bridge that way. Um, but she, it, it, um, I, I, Sylvia, Sylvia Puck is a, 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 a you know, great photographer and her books are wonderful, but she also has a gift of edit, being able to edit and teach about editing. And, and I think, um, I think uh, putting them out before um, a knowledgeable, you know, somebody you, you trust or, or a critique group even, you know, starting to um, zero in on the ones that, that had more power. Um, that's the process that I went through. And also, did Parker have a reaction to the book? Oh, he liked, he used to ask me when it was coming out and um, <laughs> he, he, he liked it. And the family, um, um, I, I, I gave a previous, I've given a previous um, book talk and they came and the first question someone asked is how did the family feel about it? And so I was able to say, well, let's ask the family. <laughs> and, and that's why I gave a little more explanation this time about how they had decided earlier that, that they wanted to share their story because um, uh, not that they had the answers, but they thought it might be helpful to um, families in situations similar to this. But uh, other people that have responded to the book are families that um, are people who've grown up in families with schizophrenia or mental illness of a parent. So, so it, um, even though it wasn't the child in the book, they, it resonated about how the impact, how it impacts on a family. I wanted to just say, um, first of all, I just bought the book because I have a friend it, it's fabulous, and I, I have a friend whose child is schizophrenic. But a million years ago, I was at a, at a workshop with Mary Ellen Mark, and she assigned me to follow a family of special needs. And as I was going off to photograph them, she said, oh, and be sure not to make your images cliche. And I never forgot it. And fast forward to now, I'm an old person, and and, and really appreciate you, when you have humility and care about what you're doing, you can't make it cliche. And that's what I thought about when I looked at your book, not just because of the pictures, but because of the narrative you chose. There's mm -hmm. so much um, humility and, and gratitude for being allowed to tell this story. Thank you. And I'm just knocked down by it. It's not just a photographic essay to me. It really is. It's a, it's a love story and how complicated that all is. And somebody else who didn't feel the way you did might have just been worried about making the picture. And so congratulations. I can't wait to get my copy and give it to my friend. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, one, one, one more question. Um, in the endorsements, you had uh, uh, Shelby Lee Adams, I believe. Yes. Um, so how did you get that endorsement? Uh, it, uh, it... Uh, well, this is how that happened. Um, I, I've known Shelby lives um, in uh, Western Massachusetts. So he lives roughly near here. But I, I took a class from Shelby at the um, ICP and so met him that way. 
and um, and we have a gallery and we showed his work several years ago. He agreed, and, and so that was a big, big deal for us. Um, but but uh, since that time, we, we've just been friends. Okay. And, um, and he came by um, one day to, to see what we were showing in the gallery. And I asked him to take a look at my book and he, he did. And he asked, you know, if, um, if I could send him um, I, some pictures and, and the text and I did. And then he wrote me back saying his mother was schizophrenic. He recognized the family. So his endorsement was a personal endorsement about the experience of being in a family like that. Okay. Yeah. Very good, thank you. Sure. Okay, uh, Karen, um, Cindy wanted to know uh, what are your some of your other projects? Well, I, um, I, you may have noticed, uh, I have a website, yes, that Karen Davis.com. And uh, I have my projects on there, but um, a, a project um, that I did a few years ago called uh, the McCann family um, is, is relevant to this, I think. It's, um, it's um, my sister who's, as I said, uh, disabled, uh, physically disabled. She died in 2006 at the age of 61, but she had a set of dolls that she had from childhood. So I, I, I took the dolls and I photographed them in domestic scenes and, and captioned them um, with just a few words. Uh, for example, uh, dinner time was tense, uh, say no more. So, so through those captions, I told the story of my family and children growing up. So it, it's it's a uh, it's a short and it's a book. It's available on Blurb, and and it, and so that that was a project I um, I did. And um, recent work, I I got a project called um, Strangely Attractive um, Art is Life, Life is Art, which which juxtaposes uh, photographs of paintings, but just hands and gestures to photographs I've taken over the years with similar, with that uh, same feel to it. So, and there's a, if you go to my website, there's a little video about Hudson, New York that I did that called Warren Street Blues that I recommend. Okay. Thank you very much, Karen and Karen. Um, it was a light crowd today, but the people that did not bother to come today really missed a great session. Thank you. Uh, Thank next you. month, um, which would be July 17th, uh, we have Dale Niles, who I did see join us today, whose work has graced our walls several times over the years and has just come up with a very successful Kickstarter uh, program um, with What Lies Within. And we're going to get a little risque next month with Renee Jacobs and her new book, uh, Polaroids. So hopefully we'll see you all in July. That'll be interesting with uh, Renee. Yes, it will be. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. And thank you both. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now.